good morning. This is where you would respond and say, like, good morning to me in a very enthusiastic, excited way. We'll try it again. Ready? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, that wasn't as enthusiastic as I hoped, but hey, I'm glad that you're here. Welcome to Convocation today. Uh, last week, we spent some time hanging out with Ryan and told us all about the issue of homelessness in L.A. and one way to combat it through charitable giving working through foundations, so that was last week. Uh, this week I'm very excited about our speaker, but let me tell you about next week. Uh, next week is probably going to be one of the best complications we've ever put together. It's spring break. He will not be here, so enjoy the week. Rest up. Watch Netflix. Um, take the week. Uh, if you haven't found something to do yet, uh, I, I know we have a couple travel options for spring break, so see me if that's something you want to talk about. But today our speaker... Um, is coming and talking about a very important issue uh, about addiction. And I know that if you're like me, you've had people around you who are very close to you, people you love, who have struggled with addiction, um, some who are in active recovery, and others who did not make it. So um, all the way from what part? Beckley, West Virginia? Beckley, West Virginia, but born and raised in Martin County, Sheldon Clark, Graduate 2010. Woo. So I guess now that's Martin County High School, right? So I'll we'll make sure I get that correct. So I'll let you further introduce yourself without further ado, our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I traveled in last night, got to stay the night with my grandmother, and spent a little bit of time with her. So everything worked out perfectly. I have to bring my two little boys, so um, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Peggy Ball, and I'm 27 years old, and I'm the daughter of two beautiful people who were chained down by their addiction. I grew up in the hills of Eastern Kentucky, and I currently reside in Bay County, West Virginia. Ever since I could remember, my life has been affected by addiction. My parents poisoned with prescription pills. When my parents was at home, they were the most beautiful people you could ever ask to be around. My dad was an amazing musician and coal miner. My dad was also a talented carpenter. That made him make something beautiful out of nothing. Not to mention the sense of humor he had. My mother was the sweetest woman you could ever ask to be around. She's always greeted you with a honey and baby, and she would give you the shirt off her back. Her smile was as bright as the sun, and you couldn't help but smile. As wonderful as they were, when my parents were under the, under the influence, they were two totally different people from what God designed them to be. There were many nights when I was around five years old that I would hide behind the couch praying that the fight would stop. These fights happened often, and boy, they were terrifying. These fights occurred for one reason and one reason only, pills. If my dad felt Mama was hiding a pill from him, there was pills to pay. I remember my father getting hot and turning the house upside down, thinking my mother had hid a stash of pills with him. <coughs> he would even go as far as to pouring cereal all over the floor and thinking she had hid a pill in there. Oftentimes, my father would get high and pass out, and my mother would sneak out and get the keys to the car, and we would be as quiet as we could, and we would go to a hotel for the night. The next day, my dad came home with his high. He would apologize and try to make up for how he acted. Unfortunately, it was the same situation as soon as he got high again. When I was little, I liked to sleep with my mom. One night after everyone had gone to sleep, my dad snuck in our bedroom and set a basket full of clothes on fire. I woke my mom up and she was able to throw the basket out of the window in time before the room caught on fire. Pills had such a hold on my dad that he didn't even care his own daughter was in that room. That's what drugs will do to you. They will make you do some crazy things and have you not care to break down with them. A lot of times at night when fighting was start, I would climb out of the window barefooted and run down the gravel road by the light of the moon to my grandmother's house. When I was 11 years old, while getting ready for school, I heard a knock at the door. Much to my surprise, it was the police and they surrounded our home. My parents were caught up in the drug bus. To make matters worse, there was a news reporter there to catch it all on camera. You can imagine my embarrassment, terror, and shame as I walked down the hill past the 
Denise Cameron to my grandmother's house. Thank God social media wasn't a thing at the time, because I don't think I could have survived the thoughts of everyone and their mother knowing that my parents were addicted. You see, at the time, I thought this was a big secret that I was hiding that nobody knew. I also felt that I was as if I was the only person in my school going through something like this. My middle school years consisted of me bouncing between homes and relatives. I switched schools a total of four times in three years. My eighth grade year, my mom landed herself in jail for almost a year. I remember the first time I went to visit her. At first, she didn't want me to come because she didn't want me to see her that way. The home bar, so to speak. She was ashamed of herself and her actions in a show. I sat down in a chair behind the glass window that was separating me from her. A phone attached to the side of the wall and I could hear her voice. She sat down in the booth and tears just rolled down both of our faces as we looked at each other. She put her hand against the glass and I put my hand against hers. I'll never forget the shame written all over her face. She picked up the phone and talked to me while trying to talk back I could hear regret in her voice. Saying goodbye after our visit was always so hard. When my mom was in jail, my dad decided to drive while under the influence and ended up in a terrible wreck, leaving him in a coma for two weeks. Thankfully, he recovered. My dad had to go to rehab because he had to learn to do a lot of things again. I remember coming to visit him, and the sheer look of joy was being from him. I was at the of his eye. He laughed and smiled the whole time, and the nurse let me know how much my dad bragged on me. Finally, my mother gets out of jail and is back home with my dad. Social services told my parents in order to get custody of me and my brother that they needed to move away from that particular area. So a few months later, that's exactly what they did. Unfortunately, the first time they moved into the house, my dad overdosed to die. I was 14 and getting ready to start high school. My mom grieved so much for my dad. She kept going downhill little by little with her addiction. My mom became my best friend. I could come to her with anything and I knew she would be understanding. At the age of 15, I got a job at a local diner. I would say 90% of my meals came from there. My relationship with my mother started feeling like I was a mother and she was a child. I was the one asking her why she was hanging around with the wrong crowd. I was constantly down her throat about her addiction. I loved my mother more than life itself, and I was so afraid to lose her like I, I did my dad. My senior year, I'm in my bedroom one night, watching a movie, and I hear a knock at my bedroom door. I open the door, and it's one of my mom's friends telling me I need to go check on my mom. I go into her room, and she's unresponsive, blue in the face, I instantly ran over to the house, ran out of the house to a neighbor. He called 911. The ambulance comes and takes her to the ER. We get to the ER and they bring me and my brother into a room and ask us some questions. My brother keeps asking how our mother is. They ignore that question and keep asking us questions. The next question comes. How old was she? Right then, at the age of 17, in the middle of my senior year, I became a woman. I lost my best friend. I kept thinking, this can't be real. How is this happening to me? I've been a good kid. I've been a good kid. I do what I'm asked, and I don't ever get in trouble. The cold hard truth is addiction doesn't discriminate. Addiction doesn't care if you have a family that needs you. Addiction doesn't care if you've been a good person on your life. Addiction doesn't care if you have one dollar or one million dollars. Addiction doesn't care. I couldn't change what happened to my parents, but I was able to choose my own path. Thankfully, I had, amazing, had an amazing support system. I had family, friends, and a community they cared. The man who owned the diner I worked at sent me up with an apartment. Teachers pushed me to finish school. I could have very easily became a statistic. Ten years later, I am a wife, I am a mother, I am a provider, I am a provider with a career, I am the daughter of two beautiful people who were chained down by their addiction. My goal is to become a big 
and hope for those struggling in a sanctified addiction. I'm 28 years old, and even today my life is still affected by my parents' addiction. I got married in 2013, seven years after my father's passing, and I didn't have any fear to walk down the aisle. There's things around the house that needs fixed. Things I know without a doubt my dad can fix, except he can't because he's not here at the cost of his addiction. In 2014, I had a miscarriage, and all I wanted to do was to cry into my mother's arms. Later that year, we were blessed to conceive again, and in 2015, we welcomed our first little boy, Isaiah. It was a bittersweet day. Although I became a mother myself, I wished more than anything my mother could be there to meet her grandson. The same exact feeling came just last year when we welcomed our sweet little family into the world. Addiction robbed us both of this beautiful experience. I was recently diagnosed with ADHD, and with that came a lot of testing. When I went in to be tested for ADHD, the therapist had a lot of questions about family history. Did your mom carry you full term? Did your mother use while pregnant with you? On and on with questions about my mother that I didn't have the answer to, and never will. Like, did you suspect that I struggled with ADHD as a child? Have you ever been tested for ADHD? There are so many questions I have that I'll never have the answer to, and that's all thanks to addiction. One day my beautiful little boys are going to ask about my parents. How am I going to answer the questions without making it sound like the nightmare that it is? How can I honor them and at the same time be honest with my boys about what happened to them? It's a conversation that I am no afraid to have, but I know in time it will come. I don't want to paint the sad picture of the grandparents to them, but how am I going to do this? I believe my parents would have been crazy over my kids. I can imagine my dad making up silly songs and teaching them to play guitar. I can see my mom being the person they run to when they're in trouble because they know they'll get away with anything when grandma was around. Fortunately, that's all I can do is imagine. All the trials and tribulations I've been through has made me who I am today. And I'm proud to be standing in front of you today with the success story of the Five Great Odds. This October made 10, 10 years since I lost my mother, and since then the rates of overdose has quadrupled. There are many of our youth in the Appalachian Mountains going through something similar at home, and we as a community have to do something. We can start by showing support to kids and teens you may know that are having a tough time at home. Be the support system. Let them know they have some fans in the stands and love them. Remind them that they are loved and worthy and they have a choice of how their love story goes.
have now for our speaker today. You said you have a brother, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, how old are you guys apart? We are three years apart. So, with the death of the mom and the dad, how did it affect him being the younger civilian? Um, since you were old and you were able to, like, at least. He's, he's three years older than you. Oh, older, so you were the older one. Yep, so, yep, that's okay. Um, so, well, I'll even ask a question. Um, did you guys go through some depression state when all this was happening? Um, just from experience, I know people tend to say, oh, depression is one kind, but in the sense of addiction, and the dealing with somebody with addiction, depression will come. Um, just because of the anxiety that you get, the, the depression aspect. Um, how did you deal with that as far as you growing up? You were a little bit older, you were a little bit older, but how did you guys deal with that um, it, together? As far as like you two being together, being close to, to work you guys through this situation? Absolutely. So we um, obviously had the uh, counseling sessions. So our therapist helped us as well as we just, like I had said before, we just seen how, um, we just watched how our mom and dad had their everyday life was. And it was hard to see that like their main goal was to find the next time. Um, and we both knew we did not want that for our family. So thankfully, my brother is um, doing great for himself. He works in the mines so and he has a beautiful family of his own. Um, and he, in, He's more quiet than I am. He's not as outgoing as I am, but he um, he also plays music and he has his own way of coping with things. He's not as open to speaking about it. I don't. I think he likes to put it in the back of his mind, so that may help him a lot too. Um, but yeah, he's doing really great for himself, and and, and when this when it comes up, he's the one I want to speak to because he's the one that went through exactly what I did. He's the only one that knows exactly how I feel. So we help each other.
about, you know, two or three. My dad got hurt in the mines, hurt his back. So that, I think that's what started it for him. And in turn, my mom ended up getting addicted too. So um, from what I can remember, he's a little hazy. And that just kind of goes back to, man, I have so many questions and I have nobody to ask. Um, but I believe that was a big cause of it. And now, do you think since the coal mine new business is booming again, do you think that having a better health system and a health care system for on active people who are working there and the ones who leave so that this cycle doesn't happen again, do you think that's an important factor? Because opioids, they don't want to lose their jobs. They get over time with good money. I think that's the fear of everybody, like, oh, if you go there and you get hurt, you don't lose your job. Do you think that happens a better health system, um, an overall health system, so that if they're on it, they can lean themselves off before they get into the, the job, right back to the job, is something that can be successful for the whole entire family on earth? Absolutely. I think that um, <clears throat> when you get hurt or if your doctor prescribes you opioids, then um, I think a lot of times that's how people get addicted. They just end up overusing, and a lot of these doctors just keep prescribing and prescribing, and not really getting down to the root of the problem to see any other alternatives. So, absolutely, I believe a better health system would um, do make a tremendous difference. Also, um, now thankfully, there's a lot more. You hear a lot more about recovery, recovery centers, and um, how to get help. At this time, you didn't really hear about that a lot. And I believe if that would have been a thing when this happened, maybe they could have got into recovery and, and could have really um, got some help and used your life to the fullest potential. Um, so I think it's wonderful that there's more recovery centers and more people are showing support for that. Because um, I think that's, that could be a big um, help in finding recovery. Thank you for your question. Anybody else?
just pushing through. If, you, if you're seeing your parents or your family member, whoever it is, going through this, and, and you see these other people with parents who are supporting them, and they get to do their sports, and they get to go to the birthday parties and all of this stuff, and, and you want that more than anything. So if you just if you just apply yourself and really see the light at the end of the tunnel and know that there's a way out of this, you're going to get out of this and you're going to make a beautiful life for yourself. I know, praise the Lord, that I have. Um, and I'm so grateful that my little boys are going to have a chance to play sports and they're going to go to the birthday parties and they're going to be able to come home and have somebody to help them with homework. Um, and, and that's priceless. So I think that if you can just see the light at the end of the tunnel and know that it's there, if you put the work and effort toward it, go for it. It's, it's, it's worth it. It's worth the climb. Thank you. changes one person's way of thinking, then it's 
that it's worth it for sure. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Is there anybody else? So summer not bounce like this a lot with your eyes. So um, so I just I just want to mention um, just to build on what she said, I think that your story of resilience is, is beautiful and thank you for having uh, the courage to share that with us. Um, but I wanted to, to to share something with you um, and maybe get your thoughts on this. I was at a conference yesterday for substance abuse providers, uh, disorder, substance use treatment providers. And um, I kept hearing the folks in the audience and even some of our professionals say those people. They were referring to people who were suffering from living with or had passed from addiction or due to their addiction as those people. Always refer to them as like another, like they are not me. And while we may not have addiction in common, there are a lot of other things we have in common with those people. And I put quotes around that because it's left. They're not those. They're just like me and you. None of us are safe from that. We're one economic issue, one injury, one anything away from being one of those people. And so as I sit there, and you know, I've, I've had several loved ones and friends struggle with addictions. And as I sit there, I hear them say those people. I found myself being very offended and very angry and, and, and wanting to just stand up and say, stop saying that. Uh, of course, it wasn't the time or the place, but I've been thinking and reflecting on that a lot since yesterday, and it's really made me want to start to be more vocal and to call people out when they say those people, but to be like, no, 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 that's your brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. you know, those are your friends, that's your neighbor, it could be your pastor um, who is struggling with these issues and we just don't know it. So how do you feel with your people say things like that, because as a social worker, we're all about dignity and worth of all people, right? So that's part of why it really gets to me. And just, you know, my faith and other things like that, it's just really important to me that, that we don't place people on a different plane than what we are. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. I think that's why a lot of people who are affected by addiction don't get help, because there's so many people that have that mindset that they're those people, that there's those dope heads, you know, mm -hmm. and they put them under that category. And how can they um, even feel halfway decent about themselves when they know everybody's out there calling them dope heads and doing this? And doing even that. professionals, are exactly. Them. Yes, it's it's yeah. ridiculous. So if somebody would just show them a little love and compassion and let them know, remind them of their worth, and let them know that there is a lot of things in this tunnel. There's help. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy, and it's got to be their choice. But there is help. They're not just, they need to be reminded that they are, um, they're a child of God. Like us. Yes, they are just like us. They fit, they're paid on the same way that we do, and that they still have a future. There's still hope for them until, as long as they have a breath of air in their lungs, they, they, there's help for them, and that they still have a chance for a beautiful life and a beautiful future. Do you get angry when you hear people say these people knowing that? These people were your parents? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's hard to <laughs> listen to that because, and, and it's hard to sometimes tell my story because I don't like painting that picture for them because I know exactly that's what a lot of people, because it's, it's the way the world is, they like to think, okay, sure. man, they were, you know, and just even with my husband, it's, it's hard to, to sit there and tell pretty stories about my family when he already knows the bad stories and he already has this picture painted. Thankfully, and he was like that when we first got together. He didn't understand why I was sitting there crying over somebody who chose drugs over me. But as our relationship went on, and he even lost one of his cousins due to addiction, he realized that they are just, just like me and him. That they just made a wrong choice, and it turned out to be um, something that's really taken over the lot. But as long as they're living, there is, there's, there's a shot of um, getting, getting straightened up and making a beautiful life for themselves. Thank you for that opinion. I really appreciate that. Is there anybody else? Um, yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, so you talked about earlier how you were dealing with it as a child. Mm -hmm. How are you dealing with it now? Because my parents are very addicts, and they've been, here, but they've been clean for the past four or five years now. But there's always that element in the room. Like, I'm always on edge. I don't trust them fully. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever could. How do you deal with it? Like, do you deal with it spiritually, religiously, or just no context at all? Yeah. 
so I can go through life and I don't have to think about it, but then um, it, it can feel like a ton of bricks sometimes. And um, I always like to think about the what ifs, as if, if they would have the chance to recover, if I could still trust them. Um, and I have to give them that shot until they mess up again. And even when they do mess up again, I have to learn to show them the grace. Um, and to, to encourage them to get back on the right track because if we can just keep condemning them and um, just keep reminding them of their, their failures, then that's not going to help them any. So just um, to continue to encourage them and continue to let them know how proud you are and how far they've came um, and how much it means to them that, that you still can still pick up the phone and say, hey mom or hey dad. That, I think that's something that a lot of people take for granted, something I wish that I could do. Even when my, my, my um, in-laws come in to visit and I can hear my, my husband say, Hey, Mom, I think just just that is, is so, you're so lucky to be able to even do that. Um, so just continue to encourage them. And, and I know it's kind of hard to not go back to that and want to bring that up because it's still hurtful. It still hurts. But at the end of the day, it, it will only make things worse, if that makes sense. Um, but definitely spiritually, the Lord has really brought me a long way and he really um, grounds me and reminds me of how far I've came um, and that I can't keep, um, I just can't keep thinking about their mistakes because it's not, it's not helping me any. Thank you for that. Anybody else?